the great introduction, I think he's as surprised as I am to see as many people in the room after the hospitality suites last night. So thanks for getting up early this morning. And it is great to be back at the Canada Strong and Free Networking Co Conference. And it is great to be back in Ottawa. It really, it is. I know you may not think that coming from Alberta, but hope and renewal are in the air. And I'm not just talking about the beautiful spring. You tend to get that a little bit earlier than we do in Alberta. The, wind of, the winds of change are blowing. And I, I think we can all feel it, can't we? Yeah, and once again, we can, truly. And I am proud to be here among so many uh, passionate conservative leaders, leaders in politics, leaders in business, and leaders in community. I, I believe our, our movement is having success right now because we have so many leaders who are willing to lead with conviction. People like, of course, the Honorable Scott Moe in Saskatchewan, and people like the Honorable Tim Houston in Nova Scotia. And I gather you heard from him yesterday, the Honorable Blaine Higgs from New Brunswick. And yeah. <laughs> And of course, how can we forget people like the Honorable Pierre Polya of the future Prime Minister of Canada, uh, <laughs> right here in Ottawa. Also, people like my friend Jamil Giovanni, the past president of the Canada Strong and Free Network, and the new Conservative Member of Parliament from Durham. When Jamil ran for his seat, the Liberals threw every nasty attack at him that they could. They called him names. They tried to undermine his accomplishments. They tried to create a false narrative about him. But of course, it, it didn't work. And Jamil told us uh, his story long before the Liberals ever saw him coming. And that made him bulletproof, winning an unbelievable 57% of the vote, the largest federal conservative victory in Durham in the past 20 years. That's an amazing accomplishment. Now, I saw a little bit of this myself, because in Alberta, we are not strangers to nasty, personal, baseless attacks from our opponents in the NDP and, of course, in the media. In fact, we're pretty used to them. I have an MLA last week who identified the NDP formula, and I'm pretty sure it's the liberal formula as well. First of all, they identify a problem. Second of all, they propose a solution that will make it so much worse. And then third of all, they use fear and smear to prevent people from hearing our solutions. And their playbook hasn't changed, but you'll notice that their old tricks aren't working the way they used to. And I think it's because we have a new generation of leaders who refuse to cower in the face of nasty personal politics. And more than that, <clears throat> in Alberta in particular, and I think among my, my colleagues as well, we're focused on policy. Policy that's making life better for people who are struggling through no fault of their own, and not just fiscal policy, but policy across the whole of government. Here's just a few things that we're doing to make life better in Alberta that don't fit the traditional conservative stereotype, but which I'm proud to support as a conservative leader a long time ago, and it may have been at a predecessor conference like this or at Civitas, I always identified as a fiscal conservative, and I think the fiscal issues are really important, and you can see that in the way we've put forward a balanced budget, the way we're paying down debt, the way we're putting money into our heritage savings account, the way we're limiting year-over-year -year increases in operational spending, those are, those are things that, that people expect of us. But we still bring in $73 billion worth of revenue. And so we have to have a cohesive social platform and a cohesive social policy about how we're going to address that. That was something that, uh, that, that one of my... Uh, one of my, my colleagues who always thought that social policy was far more important in our movement. And so you'll see that we have a conservative vision for how we deliver health care and mental health and addiction and education and public safety and address homelessness and addressing the issues of our most vulnerable. And I'll, I'll go through some of that here. So for, let me begin by saying we are saying no to dangerous and deadly safe supply drug policies. <laughs> And we're investing heavily into treatment and recovery for all those who are struggling with addiction. It's becoming known as the Alberta model. And last week we had 2,000 people come from all over Canada and around the world so that they could look at what it is that we're doing there, including signing an MOU with our friends and neighbors in Saskatchewan and Ontario. So let me tell you what we've done. Since 2019, we've added more than 10,000 treatment spaces across the province. We eliminated user fees that were in place by the NDP government, a $1,250 a month. We, we eliminated that monthly user fee. Uh, that was once a barrier to treatment for those who were going to, went into a publicly funded bed. We're also building 11 long-term recovery communities across the province, five of which are being built in direct partnership with First Nations and Métis. 
We're also expanding same-day access to life-saving treatment on, and medication uh, anywhere in the province through what we call our virtual opioid dependency program. There's 8,000 people on this. And it's um, sub suboxone and sublocate. It's a replacement so that they can begin to, to get onto the pathway of recovery. And just last week, we announced the creation of two organizations. Recovery Alberta, which will be a new provincial health agency, hived off from Alberta Health Services, dedicated to delivering mental health and addiction support. And the Canadian Centre of Recovery Excellence, which will inform best practices and evaluate programs in the field. Now, I want to compare that to what we're seeing with the NDP. Because the worst case example of it is what you're seeing all down the West Coast, and the heart of it is uh, policies that started focused exclusively on harm reduction about 20 years ago. But look at what has happened. Harm reduction became decriminalization, which became legalization. And now, let me tell you what they're doing on harm reduction. You should be watching what Adam Zebo is writing on this. He's doing remarkable work on it. But I want to quote from uh, Lily, who is a Vancouver Island nurse, because the nursing staff are coming forward. I don't know when the NDP stopped caring about our frontline health professionals, but tell me if you think this is a safe environment. Lily said, nurses at her hospital are expected to provide a multitude of harm reduction services. Lily said, including pouring alcohol for, uh, for patients and preparing their meth and crack pipes. Quote, we've been told to give them whatever they want, so they'll come back and ask for 20 pipes because they go out to the street and sell them. Even though everyone knows that patients resell this drug paraphernalia, she and her colleagues cannot withhold supplies, she said. That's what's happening under the NDP drug policy in Vancouver. There's another story in that article talking about a nurse who just became, uh, had just given birth, became a new mom, and her, uh, her doctor told her to stop breastfeeding because of her exposure to secondhand methanol, uh, fentanyl smoke impacting her child. That is what NDP uh, drug policy looks like and that's why we have a better solution and we're going to be continuing to push it. We're also saying enough is enough when it comes to crime and social disorder in our communities. We're investing to hire, train and deploy more, more police officers, sheriffs, community partners in towns and cities and we've been clear we won't let Albertans freeze in gang-run encampments. Instead we're creating a navigation and support center as a single point of access to housing, addiction treatment and other support. So let's remember what the left wants. The left wanted to defund the police. They've demoralized our frontline police officers, which makes it very difficult for them to be attracted into that line of work. We've turned that around because we love our frontline police officers, especially our sheriffs, which you will see that there will be more and more of them being hired. We also... <laughs> But we also didn't accept what the courts told us about encampments. Remember the courts? They were standing in the way saying you can't eliminate these encampments. Well, we watched and, and read through the lines. They said you can't eliminate the encampments unless you have shelter space for people to go. So we increased our shelter space and then we worked with Chief Dale McPhee, who's the chief of the Edmonton Police Service. And as they dismantled the camps, we had a bus taking people to a navigation center at the navigation center. All the services that they needed that had been spread out all over the city were in one spot where they could get ID printed off same day on site. They could get access to our virtual opioid dependency program. They could get access to a mental health or addiction treatment. They could get access to indigenous support services. They could get access to shelter. They could ac get access to uh, to uh, housing, because we have a number of different housing programs, and they could get access to income support, all in one place. And as a result, we've helped nearly 900 people get connected to 3,000 services. This is our success in two months. We eliminated over 700 encampments. When I got an update from Dale McPhee, he said that there were about 28 that were left. That's the kind of success that we've had. And as for our shelter spaces, we increased them to 1,800. We typically average about 1,440 people in them at night. So this is not what it seems. The encampments don't necessarily have people living there. That's where the gangs were just going to store their drugs, stash their drugs, store their, uh, their guns, stash their guns, and intimidate people. We had people dying in these encampments. They were getting burned out. They were, they were getting burned to death. They were being human trafficked. They were being intimidated. And the... Uh, the chief was pleased to report that since we started this in mid-January, no one has died in, one of, in an encampment in Edmonton. That's what conservative policy looks like.
I should also just say, because I just love these stories, when you help that many people, you end up with incredible stories. And one story that my seniors community and social services minister likes to tell is of a woman who came in and said she wanted to get clean and she wanted to get reconnected with her family. So we contacted her sister, who hadn't heard from her. She had been on the missing and murdered indigenous women's of a list for 10 years. They hadn't been in contact. And so we were able to connect them. And now she's on the road to what we hope will be a permanent recovery. There was also a, a man who came in with his dog. And we had a place in the back where they could sleep. So he stayed for four days. We got him connected to a bunch of services. Well, he came back after he left a few days later with four of his friends. And he said, you know what? They helped me. They're going to help you too. So don't be afraid to tackle these tough issues. This is absolutely the heart of what it is that we need to do in government, particularly at the provincial level. And we can just do it better. So let me say one last thing. We are also uh, undertaking a bold transformation of our health care system, arguably the boldest in the history of our province, in an effort to refocus a slow and outdated system and create a single, fully integrated and high-functioning system. Now, for some reason, and I don't know why this is, conservatives, whenever we get elected, we just hand it over to the left. The left says, okay, we're running it. We're the experts. We got this. Just give us more money. So we've created a system in Alberta where it was basically one entity that was managing all of our health care and also contracting to their competitors. You can imagine how well that went. And then also doing the evaluation of their own performance. And every year they just came back and said, oh yeah, we're doing just fine. Don't look any deeper. Just uh, write a bigger check. So we said no. So we're separating it so that we are going to have acute care services. We are going to return our hospitals to delivering hospital services. We are going to have separate mental health and addiction, which I've already mentioned. We're going to have a separate stream as well for primary care because we have the same problem that has existed in every province of not having enough patients attached to a family doctor or nurse practitioner. And we're also uh, going to, to make sure that uh, we uh, deal with the issues of long-term care. One of the things that I noticed, and Doug Ford mentioned this in incidentally, got me wondering what our problem was in Alberta. They mentioned that there were 6,000 people in, Al in Ontario acute care beds awaiting placement in alternative levels of care. Well, we just did that count, and we found that there's at any given time about 1,500 patients who are in acute care waiting placement in long-term care beds, which is significant. We only have 6,500 acute care beds. So is it any wonder that what you see is that the, pay, the beds are being used for the wrong purpose, and so when patients come in, there's nowhere for them to go. It backs into the hallways, and when the hallways get full, it gets backed into the back of ambulances, and it causes a sclerosis in the whole system. That's why we have to take this on. That's why I'm just not going to defer to terrible liberal and NDP policy that tells us that we can't touch Healthcare, we have to. We owe it to our citizens. It's almost 40 to 50 percent of the money that we spend at the provincial level, and we can do it so much better. We can. You may also be aware that our government has intru uh, introduced new policies aimed at supporting Alberta children as they navigate their, do their journey of self discovery, as well as their parents. Now, first and foremost, I want to emphasize that these policies are, are founded on principles of love, and of love and respect for every individual, regardless of their gender identity. And with these policies, which we'll soon be seeking to enshrine into law, our government is committed to ensuring that every Albertan, regardless of gender identity, feels supported and protected. We're committed to safeguarding the rights of transgender individuals, providing them the resources that they need to navigate their lives and succeed as people and as citizens of Alberta. And because one of the most sacred responsibilities that we hold as parents, as teachers, as elected leaders, as community leaders, is to nurture and guide children as they grow into adulthood. It's our duty to create an environment where they feel safe. And as we do that, I believe we have to protect children from making decisions that they are far too young to make and that could prevent them from having children of their own when they do ultimately become adults. <laughs> And I also genuinely believe that the vast, 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 vast majority of parents love and support their children unconditionally. I do not subscribe to the notion that parents don't have rights, that parents have ill intent, or that parents cannot be trusted with information pertaining to their children. Our government will be moving forward with these policies, and we expect to have broad support as we do. 
I was at the airport on my way here and I met somebody who I don't, uh, is originally from Manitoba, actually is a, a guitarist in a popular Canadian band. And he said, I've been an NDP supporter all my life, so of course my security stands up. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, but they lost me on their policy with regard to kids. He has kids who are nine and 14 years old. And you know what it is? It doesn't matter whether you're liberal or conservative or NDP or green, or whether you're a member of the LGBT community or not, everyone wants to know what's going on with their kids. That's the, the, the foundation that we have, and that's why we're gonna win on this one too. So as I mentioned, in Alberta, Conservatives aren't just balancing the budget, creating jobs, attracting investment, and keeping taxes low. I mean, we are doing that too, but we're also investing in people and communities and a diverse economic future with opportunities for all citizens. Uh, while we face a federal government that seems bent on making life harder and more expensive for Canadians, and Albertans in particular, we're listening and responding to the needs of Albertans. We're ensuring that Alberta remains a land of hope, opportunity, and freedom for all those who seek it. And despite what you hear from the Liberal NDP coalition and from the <clears throat> media, our efforts are working. <laughs> More people are coming to Alberta today than at any point in our province's history, and we're working around the clock to make sure that the Alberta advantage is alive and well for them when they arrive. As Ronald Reagan once said, the greatest leader is not necessarily the one who does the greatest things. He or she is the one that gets the people to do the greatest things. And this is a room full of exceptional people, elected officials, thought leaders, policymakers, experts, strategists, you name it. But we are no better than so many Canadians who wake up every day and lead their respective lives with courage and conviction. The farmer who grows the food we need to survive. The energy worker who creates the fuel that we rely on to heat our homes and to drive our cars. The new Canadian who works three jobs to give his or her children a, a better life than they had. The student whose dream of inventing the next Blackberry or the next Facebook. The working mom and the mother who makes the selfless choice to stay home and raise the next generation of Canadians. Canadians have the people, uh, Canadian people have the potential to do anything, but it is up to us to create the right conditions for them to realize their potential and to succeed. As decision makers, let's keep that in mind, that our number one goal is to create those conditions, not for our own benefit, but for the benefit of others. The policies we are seeing out of the Liberal NDP coalition right now are the exact opposite of what I'm describing. These are policies that are all about limiting the potential of people. I had a friend who described uh, to me the carbon tax. Her view of it is it's essentially a sin tax on productivity. Isn't, it, isn't that what it is when you think about it? It's a sin tax on productivity. But limiting what you can do, what you can buy, what you can drive, what you can produce, what you can keep for yourself, what you can dream of accomplishing, th that is what they're doing on the Liberal NDP coalition. This is all about having a very real impact. This is already having a very real impact on our society and on our economy. The Bank of Canada recently said the need to improve productivity in Canada has reached an emergency level, stating, and I quote, in an emergency, break the glass. Well, it is past time to break the glass. Past, uh, bad economic policies and out of control spending from the NDP Liberal Coalition have broken and demoralized far too many Canadians, but, unfortunately, but fortunately the people do still have hope. They have hope because they are seeing what we are doing in provinces like, as I mentioned, Alberta, uh, Nova Scotia, Saskatchewan, New Brunswick, and they know that there is a better way. They are looking to Conservatives for policy solutions, and the good news is that we have the solutions. They're ingrained in who we are and what we believe. So let's move forward with courage and with conviction. Let's not let the media dictate who we are or tell our story for us. Let's tell our own story. Let's do it with compassion. Let's do it with conviction. And let's make life better for everyday people from coast to coast who are the soul of this great nation and who embody the hope for our great future. And may Alberta and Canada remain forever strong and free. Give it up for Premier Danielle Smith. That was wonderful. Thank you.
don't let the media tell the story is the great cue for the journalist to come on stage, by the way. So thank you for that. J just to give a, a bit of disclosure, uh, Premier Smith and I have known each other for many years. We used to work together in radio, and now I'm a podcaster and she's the Premier. So take from that what you will. But whenever Andrew would sub in for me when I was on the air, when I came back, I got a ream of text saying, oh, man, I like Andrew so much better. Can't we have him instead? <laughs> yeah, I, well, I, yeah I, was, I was her guest host, uh, which I'd have to check the Constitution, but I believe that means I'm acting premier in Alberta because <laughs> uh, I've never formally been released from that. But uh, you ended on the carbon tax, and, and I spoke about this uh, a fair bit yesterday w with Premier Higgs, who I'm, I'm glad was uh, not tired of me after that interview that he's returned. And... You have said so much and have been such a strong voice on, on this, and, and that uh, comment about it being a syntax on, on productivity I quite like, but I, I have to ask how those arguments do not apply equally to the gas tax, which in Alberta has gone up this year, uh, has gone up again within the last couple of weeks. It treats something that for a lot of Albertans is necessary, driving around as though it's an elective choice. Well, you'll, you'll see that we added a, a tax on electric vehicles, Mm -hmm. um, and what we, when we put that $200 tax in, the, we calculated it as being essentially the equivalent of what an average driver would spend in fuel tax so that electric vehicles are paying their fair share of our road maintenance. That's what the connection is in most provinces between the tax we charge. That's the originally how it began. And then the federal government layered on their 10 centiliter tax. And of course, Stephen Guibault doesn't want to build roads anymore. We're zero for nine in our province and getting cost share. I don't know if, um, if Premier Higgs has had any better luck on that. Uh, but then they've also now levied on, I think, what it amounts to 17.6 cents in the carbon tax. And then on top of that, they charge GST on all of it. So they're charging tax on tax, which is, I think, another 7.5 cents at prices the way they are today. So, yes, we do accept 13 cents a litre to pay for roads. And they accept 35 cents to essentially pay for nothing. So I would say that I cannot sacrifice our need to gain revenue to build roads to make room for them to continue with the punitive tax that does nothing. It, 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 because a couple of things I'd say. The, the argument that they make that it will encourage people to change behavior, they completely undermine because Stephen Guibault admitted that the carbon tax isn't going to have an effect until 2060, which means we're all paying punitive taxes until then. And there really just aren't options. I was uh, talked to any of the, uh, the automakers and the auto dealers that if you wanted to go out and switch to an electric vehicle tomorrow, to avoid the tax. You couldn't because there aren't enough of them being be produced and the infrastructure isn't in your home to do it and the infrastructure isn't there for public charging station to do it. Hydrogen vehicles as well. There's We have a hundred of them in Alberta. We've got a 5,000 car challenge but if you wanted to go out and buy a hydrogen zero emissions vehicle, you couldn't because they're not producing enough of them. If you wanted in a, my province where I think 90% of the homes are heated with natural gas, if y you simply couldn't switch to a heat pump because they don't work in minus 35 and you can't get insurance if you do without having a backup of some other type of, 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 of heating. So all it is then, if there isn't a reasonable way to switch to an equal or lower cost option, then all it is is a punitive tax on consumers. That's the reason why, I'm, why, why they're different. But, but when the Alberta, yeah, fair, fair. But when the Alberta government offered fuel tax relief, those issues you described were still there, and it was a recognition that life was unaffordable. And, and it, unaffordability comes in layers. There's inflation, carbon tax, fuel tax, general cost of living. So the crisis of affordability is still there. Well, let, let me say, when we, when we brought through our relief program, our gas prices in our province were $1.89. Mm -hmm. So our tax is 13 cents. So that would have taken it down from $1.89 down to you know, $1.76. And right now, today, gas prices in Alberta are $1.58. So we will continue with our program that when uh, oil prices go beyond $90, we'll take that tax off again. In fact, I'd love to see the federal government do the same. Make, make it variable so that when the, the prices get up above a certain level, we're all paying more because of that. Take the tax off at that point so that you're not adding to the problem. And I should mention that we, are, we remain 
uh, along with Saskatchewan, uh, the second lowest in, in the country in our overall price of, of fuel. Uh, Manitoba followed our lead, uh, reduced the, the, the carbon tax, or took their, their fuel tax off after Wab Canoe got elected. Uh, but the other provinces, I think British Columbia, who are the poor souls from British Columbia facing a buck 98, a buck 98? They couldn't afford to fly here, actually. That's why there are more of them. <laughs> that, that's why. So, so I would say we, we, we are trying to be variable because we also have to run a balanced budget. And um, that's the first promise that I made to, to Albertans. And that extra four cents a litre that we added back on just on April the 1st, that's the difference between us running a $400 million surplus or not. So when those additional revenues come in, absolutely. Our, our strategy is to give the money back to Albertans. A, a couple of nights ago, uh, Boris Johnson was on this stage with Tony Abbott, and they had a, a spirited discussion on climate policy. And, and Boris Johnson had made a comment, which uh, some people have asked me about, and I wanted to get your thoughts on, that basically it's Pascal's wager. So we should uh, accept that, oh, maybe global warming's a big hoax, maybe it's a, an existential threat, but it is, he said basically there are no costs to acting as though it is something that is a grave and, and pressing threat. And then I noted, I think it was yesterday on Twitter, Stephen Gilbo had met Boris Johnson and was praising him, which is inherently the n endorsement you don't want. Uh, but... <laughs> I, I reject that premise, and I assume you do, Premier, as well, that, that going along with this, and to be frank, going along with what Boris Johnson's government did in the UK is without cost. Well, if you try to accelerate things, as Stephen Gibo wants to do, net zero power grid by 2035, net zero vehicles by 2035, net zero homes, that's the, the new approach. You think this accelerator fund is altruism? It's not. They want net zero homes which I think will ultimately mean no one's allowed to hook up to natural gas. You all have to have heat pumps. You're not allowed to be able to have uh, electricity that comes from an emitting source. That's where I think they're going with that. So I'm, I'm already, if you can imagine, what's it going to cost you to buy a new car? What's it going to cost you to change out your home heating? What are the extra costs associated with building net zero construction? Uh, what's the uh, cost associated with taking all of our home heating off of the uh, natural gas system and putting it onto uh, the electrical grid. Um, one of our, our leaders in Alberta says that's a $70 billion cost. What's the cost associated with upgrading our grid so that you can plug in more than two electric vehicles in a home? Because if you put two vehicles in a, on a, a 12 a home city block, your transformer will blow. So you need to upgrade your transformer, which is $40,000. And that right now is going to the cost of the, the third guy who ends up buying, buying the electric car. So how much is that? Uh, transformed over all our entire system, probably hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars. I think it was $1.6 trillion, in fact, that was estimated to implement the Gibo vision of everything being on the power grid, your car, your heating, as well as current electricity from an all sources, including industrial, and then having all of that be from non-emitting sources. Uh, so, yeah, it's very costly when you're trying to do that. Now, the approach I would take is I have no problem with a transition away from emissions. We do this all the time. We found clean ways to be able to take sulfur dioxide out of um, uh, coal plants so that we could have uh, address issues of acid rain. We found ways to, to find an alternative for chlorofluorocarbons uh, to address ozone. And I believe that we're already seeing with carbon capture utilization and storage and some of the incredible mines that we have that we'll be able to find a way to, to capture the CO2 and turn it into useful products, which has been the, the history of, of our industry. But it is an, um, a transition away from emissions. It is not a transition away from the production of oil and natural gas. A barrel of oil provides 6,000 different products for us now. How are we going to be able to have lubricants? How are we going to be able to have petrochemicals? How are we going to be able to have food safe materials? How are we going to be able to have medical uh, uh, safe, safe materials if we, if we don't have petrochemicals? How are we going to have roads to drive our zero emissions vehicles on because they're made of asphalt, which comes from the bitumen that is produced in Alberta? So the, the approach that I believe the left is taking is defeatist. It, it, it doesn't look at the incredible innovation that we have, the brilliant minds that we have, who are able to take what are traditional waste streams and turn them into something valuable. And I see Michael Binion is here too. Is it? He has done some great work in, in elevating and showcasing. Same with Second Street. I don't know if Colin Craig is here. Elevating and showcasing the kind of products that are being made out of CO2. So in my province, Heidelberg is a cement company that is going to take the CO2 embedded in their cement and make a stronger concrete. 
and there'll be the first net zero cement plant in the entire world. Dow Chemical has, yeah, truly. Uh, Dow Chemical is taking uh, the CO2, working with a company called Lindy. The Lindy is creating hydrogen, and then they're burying the CO2. They'll be the first net zero petrochemical plant. Um, the, and then on top of that, we've already got air products, which is taking the CO2, burying it, and, and doing uh, net zero hydrogen. That's what an emissions reduced world looks like. But all of that takes time. You cannot snap your fingers and have innovation. But I think it's our job as government to champion what it is the industry is doing, to support them so everybody knows that there's a different way of doing it. Like that's the theme. The, 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 go the guys on the left have a, a single-minded approach to how they want to do things. They identify a problem, they propose solutions that make it worse, and then they fear monger that, oh, look at those guys on the other side, they want to do nothing at all. Couldn't be further from the truth. We identify the problem, we identify solutions that will actually work, and then we support our industry and those uh, nonprofit players that we believe will get there. Making it worse is actually the headline of the broadband conference just down the road there. Uh, well, you, you said energy transition, so I guess transition is a logical segue to the next topic here. I, let's discuss your approach to gender in Alberta, because I, I discussed with Premier Higgs yesterday how New Brunswick was the first to really go into this terrain, but Alberta was the most extensive in terms of what you proposed, because you didn't just talk about parental rights and consent and knowledge in a, an education context, you also extended it to sports and also to the healthcare sector when, uh, uh, you know, interventions, medical interventions are concerned. And we haven't seen the legislation, so I'm hoping you can provide a little bit more detail in, in what you hope to achieve. And, and one particular aspect of this is the protection of single sex spaces, so uh, women's shelters and also prisons, you know, in, in your, or jails rather, in Alberta. I mean, are, y are you proposing something where uh, biologically male inmates who identify as female would not be permitted to go into female jails? Well, well, look, let me, let me tell you my starting point, because I've, I've talked with many transgender individuals over the years, from the first time I got into politics, all the way through when I was on radio, um, until as recently as yesterday, because we've got uh, transgender conservatives that are tra fellow travelers with us who want to give us advice on, on implementing the policy. The, uh, um, but the, the issue that I began with was, are we giving good medical care? to those who do transition. Because in our province, uh, we don't do the surgeries. We have them um, have people fly out to Quebec to receive surgery, and then they fly back home, and we don't have good post-operative care. In fact, a lot of these surgeries have complications, and so that was one of the starting points. Uh, the, the, those who uh, have decided to transition as well need lifelong support for hormone treatment and also lifelong support for the consequences that might happen of um, uh, of doing that transition, and so then you get so that's where it was w where it began is how do we give good medical care for those as adults who make that transition? But then you have to have the conversation at what age is the right age to make those decisions? And if you look at uh, Dr. Hillary Cass, the Cass report was just released in um, in the UK. And she was uh, this is the most comprehensive review of the medical literature and the science behind this. And what she discovered, quite frankly, is there isn't very good science. So notwithstanding what the left like to tell us, there isn't good long-term data about how many kids go on puberty blockers and whether it impacts their future fertility and at what age. There isn't long-term information about what happens to those kids by the time they reach 25. Do they continue with the transition? Do they detransition? They don't do that kind of study. And so they've said, let's take a pause. Um, we're not going to assign uh, puberty blockers as a matter of course, and we're going to be a lot more deliberate in going through and making sure that you're part of a, a, a medical team when those decisions are made, as well as that there's long-term studies on it. So we're, we're watching what the emerging scientific evidence is in the world. This is science. The left says they believe in science. This is what science looks like as you follow the information where it goes. So that's where we began. And then, of course, because the first step of transitioning is changing name, changing pronouns, dressing on the, oppos on the uh, opposite gender, you, you cannot be out to your entire school community. And the only people who aren't allowed to know are your parents. You can't, you can't have that. And, uh, and that's important context, but but so, so let me get let me sex spaces. let me let me answer your question. I um, so one of the transgender individuals I spoke with it has not transitioned below, mm -hmm. and um, she likes to go for spa days with her girlfriends. And there's uh, locker rooms where she she just told me like it wouldn't be the same experience for me. 
if I had to be in a separate locker room and not be able to be out with my girlfriends. I think the issue is modesty, that, that you cannot, if you have not been fully transitioned, then you shouldn't be exposing yourself in uh, female-only spaces because no one, no one should know. You should either be behind in a washroom stall or you should, uh, you should show modesty and then it's not, it doesn't become an issue. It's, it's when there is, when women feel that their private spaces, when they're, they're alone and they're naked, that's when they want to make sure that their, safe s their pl places are protected. So at the moment, I have not seen anything. <laughs> I've not seen anything in Alberta that leads me to believe I have to do anything about that. So I'm, I'm not going in that direction. And is that uh, for same for jails as well? Correct. I haven't seen anything. I mean, I, I'm watching what's happening uh, internationally and what's, ha what's happening in the rest of the country. But I, in our own province, I haven't seen anything that rises to it. Because remember, in provincial jails, I think it's two years less a day mm -hmm. that, that you serve. So I, I have not observed any emergence of problems that might happen um, that, I'm, that I'm seeing elsewhere. As we close here, what's the message to Alber Alberta or from Alberta to Ottawa that you want to bring while you're here? <laughs> Well, you may have seen this week, I introduced the stay out of my backyard bill. Um, it's uh, the Provincial Priorities Act. <laughs> my message to Ottawa is that federal politicians and the Prime Minister in particular should do his job and stop trying to do my job. That, that's, that's what the message is. And uh, I don't know if Premier Higgs would, would uh, ha ha said the same thing, but when we meet as premiers, the really interesting thing is it doesn't matter whether it's NDP or Liberal or Progressive Conservative or UCP or Saskatchewan Party. We all come from different parties and different perspectives, but we are united in that, that the federal government should stay focused on the things which they need to do. There's lots of things they need to do. They, they need to shore up national defense so that we're not an international embarrassment. They, they need to make sure that our foreign policy is aligned with our allies instead of our enemies. They need to make sure that they're expanding international trade so every single one of our 10 provinces and territories can get our product to market. They need to, they need to build critical infrastructure like the Trans Mountain Pipeline, which is going to be getting to the finish line. That is the kind of things that they should do more of. They should be building ports. They should be building rail lines. They should be building highways, Stephen Guibault. They should be making sure that they are living up to their obligation and their treaties of, with First Nations. They should be f funding health care on reserve, mental health and addiction treatment on reserve. Uh, water on reserve, building out economies on reserve. They should make sure that our, the value of our dollar is not diminishing internationally. They should make sure that they can process passports efficiently. They should make sure that, we c that the uh, Pearson Airport is, an ex is a, a lovely experience to go through and that all of our <laughs> airports are operating efficiently. There is no shortage of things the federal, that the Prime Minister can do. It's not a boring job. So when you see in Alberta that we are going to take a posture more like Quebec, which is no thank you, we don't need your policy advice on school lunch programs, on pharma care, on dental care, uh, that is just, just give us the money and trust that we'll be able to deliver on this. That's the approach that we're going to take and we're going to be pretty vocal about doing so and I hope to see some of the other premiers do it. Premier Danielle Smith, thank you very much. We'd we'll now like to welcome up Corey tonight to say a few words here, but thank you, Premier.